Want to send half a day to this Uh Hi and hello, everyone. My name is Riley Taitingfang, and I am uh, currently a postdoc at the University of Arizona in the Native Nations Institute and the Udall Center. I'm very pleased to be here today to chat with you about the care principles for biodiversity data management. And I want to extend a big sign of maase or thank you to Abby Benson for convening this panel um, and also to the Tadwig organizers for putting on this event. I also want to acknowledge my colleagues from the Collaboratory for Indigenous Data Governance, uh, many of whom have shaped and contributed to much of the content that I'll share with you in this presentation today. So I'm gonna jump right into things and I'm going to start by situating myself uh, for you all a little bit, telling you how I come to the work that I do. And then I'll spend most of the talk just really giving us some grounding into the practices and the concepts of Indigenous data sovereignty or IDSOV and Indigenous data governance, IDGov. And then um, I will close by mentioning a couple of uh, projects or tools that we're developing toward uh, implementation of the care principles in repositories and other data holding institutions. I really invite you all to think about um, as I'm talking, where your work in biodiversity fits in, and we'll love any questions or feedback toward that end. Okay, so I wanna start by sharing with you uh, some of my relations, so the important people and places in my life, uh, because these really shape my background and how I come to my research and understand my responsibilities in my research and my work. And so uh, you see some of my uh, ancestors on here, present and past. These are my grandparents on the left side, uh, my parents, uh, some of my community in Guahan or Guam. And then in the bottom right is some folks from the Indigenous, uh, the Collaboratory for Indigenous Data Governance at our retreat in Tucson a few months ago. And so I want to share with you that uh, I myself, I'm Chamorro, which means I'm Indigenous to the Mariana Islands in Micronesia. Uh, specifically, my family has ties to the island of Guahan or Guam. Um, I'm also of English, Scottish, Irish, and Portuguese descent. And so as an Indigenous person with these deep uh, relations to uh, my home islands, but living away from my home islands and our diaspora, I really understand my responsibilities um, to our community as something that I take with me wherever I go. And another piece of that is also recognizing that while in diaspora, as many of our Chamorro um, relatives are, uh, living away from our home islands, often we're setting down roots on the indigenous lands of other peoples. So something that I really value is building solidarity, building cross-community collaboration with other indigenous folks uh, to collectively build our power for self-determination. And in the Native Nations Institute, we really focus on this um, for it within data sovereignty, this movement for indigenous data sovereignty. And so now I wanna give you a little background into um, indigenous peoples and biodiversity data. So according to the UN, some 476 million people around the world identify as indigenous. Now that's just 6% of the global population, yet indigenous peoples manage or hold tenure to some one fourth of the land's surface, and they support up to 80% of its biodiversity. And this is really characterizing terrestrial biodiversity. So to give us a sense of, um, you know, coastal oceanic marine biodiversity stewarded by indigenous peoples, uh, you can look at this map from uh, Cisneros et al. in PLOS One. Okay. And so what are indigenous data? I mean, think of all the tremendous value that exists in the natural resources I mentioned and also the knowledge systems of the people who've long tended to those environments, right? There's great value in both. And so when we say indigenous data, uh, we're really talking about data information knowledges in any format that impact indigenous peoples, nations, and communities at the collective and the individual levels. So this can be uh, data about indigenous peoples, non-human relations. This is data about indigenous people as individuals, as well as as collectives, right? And of course, indigenous peoples data are both generated by indigenous peoples themselves and by other entities. One thing is important, an important point to drive home is that indigenous peoples have always been data experts, right? Indigenous knowledge systems are developed and refined over many generations through a close observation of and relationship to indigenous folks' environments. 
right? Uh, many indigenous cultures use a variety of both oral and physical mechanisms for storing and transmitting knowledge and information. And so a couple of examples on this slide from North America, starting from the left clockwise is a totem pole, uh, the Lakota winter count, also an autumn calendar stick and a wampum belt. And I also can show you something from my home islands in Micronesia. Uh, this is a Marshallese stick chart. And so this is actually a navigational tool. Uh, this is mapping different uh, ocean currents and also the shells are showing different islands and, and atolls. And so this is something navigators would use to kind of train themselves on the local oceanic environment and then uh, commit to memory when they go voyaging at sea. And so as I'm sure many of you are aware, of course, um, despite the sort of persistence and robust nature of these knowledge systems, many colonial projects have been aimed in different ways at extinguishing, suppressing, or co-opting indigenous knowledge. And so this is why um, indigenous sovereignty and specifically indigenous data sovereignty are a really important part of indigenous people's projects everywhere to revitalize, restore, protect, and pass on their knowledge systems. And so I wanna just ground us a little bit in what we mean when we say indigenous data sovereignty or IDSOV. And so IDSOV is founded on the inherent sovereignty of indigenous peoples and refers to the rights of indigenous peoples to govern their data from collection and storage to use and reuse. Um, IDSOV leverages different laws, policies, agreements, including the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples or UNDRIP and other kinds of recognition, so nation state recognition of indigenous peoples, treaties and other mechanisms. And IDSOV is really about um, supporting the roles and responsibilities that communities have for the care and the use of their knowledge. Um, and then embedding those roles and responsibilities within data ecosystems and across the whole data life cycle. And I also wanna note that only indigenous peoples and nations can exercise indigenous data sovereignty as rights holders, as those people who have inherent rights to the sovereignty. And so this means other kinds of entities and institutions can um, support IDSOV, right, through um, governance mechanisms, but are not the ones exercising sovereignty. This is a figure I like to share because it shows that there's an interdependent relationship between indigenous people's projects of nation building and also the work of reclaiming their, their data systems. So indigenous peoples need accurate, relevant and timely data for their policy and decision-making activities. This is what we call data for governance. And then indigenous peoples also need mechanisms to honor, protect and control their information both internally and externally. And this is what we call governance of data. And so I also want to know uh, or give you a little bit of background on kind of the genesis of the care principles. So um, first, it's important to recognize there are many uh, different kinds of principles developed by Indigenous folks internationally and locally or domestically. So, of course, at the level of broad principles, you have something like care, working across international contexts. Also, in, there's regional principles like OCAP from a First Nations Canadian context or in Aotearoa, the Ma uh, Maori data sovereignty principles. And then of course, there's different kinds of uh, frameworks and principles that exist at the level of individual ind indigenous nations. And so those principles have of course developed alongside more mainstream frameworks or principles for data. And what would eventually become CARE began with a coalition of indigenous scholars who were assessing uh, the values or kind of comparing the values among mainstream and indigenous data principles and governance. And so a kind of key takeaway I want to frame for you from this effort was that the mainstream conversation around data has been more data centric, right? We have um, FAIR as an example here, making data findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. On the other hand, indigenous communities uh, principles for data have been more people and purpose oriented. And so that's from uh, the point from which the care principles were developed, right? To really put that people in purpose, intention back into principles for data. And so I think folks here are um, at least fairly familiar with care, but I'll quickly walk us through C-A-R-N-E. So collective benefit, 
um, which details that data ecosystems should be designed and function in ways that um, enable indigenous peoples as collectives to benefit from data. Authority to control really emphasizes the need for those working with data to uphold indigenous people's rights to support their interests for data. Responsibility reminds us that working with indigenous data needs to center indigenous uh, people's ethics, or excuse me, um, indigenous people's self-determination and benefit in data relationships. And then finally, ethics focuses on using indigenous people's uh, frameworks um, for, as an ethical guidance to um, shape decisions or action related to harm, risk, benefits, justice, and future use. Um, I also wanna mention that care principles are meant to be sort of a high level framework and that they really encourage more local customization, more relationship-based tailoring to specific contexts, right? Um, in other words, this is not a one size fits all model. Okay. So I also wanna note that um, while I kind of contrasted some more open, or excuse me, more uh, mainstream data frameworks, uh, something like FAIR is actually really developed to be complementary with CARE. And it's something we like to be really clear about, right? That while the FAIR principles seek to increase data sharing, um, often in an open science paradigm, CARE bring that people and purpose orientation for data governance. And so that really complements the data centric nature of the FAIR principles. And so implementing both CARE and FAIR should be seen as necessary to allow indigenous peoples to govern access and use their data and share on their own terms. And an adage that maybe you've heard that I think is helpful toward this end is as open as possible, as closed as necessary. I think that really gets at the sort of tenet of balancing that open science paradigm with responsibilities to indigenous people's rights. And building off of this, I wanna point you to a couple of resources that may be of interest. So um, this is the recently published GITA, uh, the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, um, Ind indigenous people's rights on data. So they're really are articulating and delineating what are indigenous people's rights within data. And this is sort of an important shift in moving from the language of stakeholders to rights holders, okay? And then also relevant for folks on this call is this paper from Dr. Lydia Jennings and colleagues that recently came out in uh, Nature. And this is um, applying care for biodiversity research and ecology research then really giving very concrete practice to understand how care can sow community level ethics into disciplines that may be uh, more characterized by extractive research practices. Okay, in my final few minutes now, I'm going to point you to a couple of the tools that we're building, and these are really works in progress, um, but we're hoping to get these out and launched in, in sort of stages over the next few years. So one project that I'm leading on care implementation is focused on repositories, but also extends to other data holding entities. This is what we're calling a phased framework. And so this is a series of kind of stepwise but iterative phases for what do you do if you are in a repository or institution and you want to enter into the work of um, implementing care principles. And so right now we're really, um, we've articulated six phases you can look at here. And there's a variety of different kinds of tools, practices that we're outlining for each. Um, but what we're kind of living inside of right now as we're working with our partners across different institutions and projects is this phase zero, preparing your institution. So we call this zero to really recognize that uh, in order to meaningfully and effectively implement care in your setting, there's a lot of foundational work that needs to happen first, right? There's um, critical learning that needs to happen about IDSOV and IDGov. There's kind of uh, realigning the infrastructure, the cyber infrastructure, the social technical aspects of your institution's um, practices and policies to uh, more effectively implement care, um, among other things, building and enriching relationships with indigenous folks and specific uh, tribes or nations whose data you may hold. And so this right now, um, we're writing a manuscript that's really teasing apart phase zero and drawing on real lived experiences and practices from folks who are doing this work in different contexts. So some of our partners include University of Maine, EDNA, um, ASU, so Arizona State, Bio Collections, and the Labriola Library, um, and some folks based in Europe, the local indicators for climate change impacts. 
And the last project I want to point you to is our work for building an assessment tool for care. And so we're calling this the care criteria um, or the care data maturity model. So this is really inspired by the FAIR data maturity model, which measures the fairness of different data sets. And we're looking at making something analogous to really um, outline concrete kind of measurable practices for how care implementation is going in a particular setting. And um, uh, yeah, having a tool for people to kind of um, score or assess or evaluate care implementation within their context and then identify and target certain areas for improvement. And so we've been, this has been a many years long effort that I've recently picked up um, but basically, this is the foundation of this work was sort of analyzing, collecting different, again, on the ground practices. How are people doing care implementation in different settings, some of which are listed on this slide, and then turning those into really, you know, specific, measurable, actionable um, statements of what we call indicators. And so, if the example here is how do you really operationalize care, looking at this particular sub principle, which is um, in this case, about recognizing Indigenous peoples' rights and interests. So this is a sort of um, more vague or ambiguous as a statement. So the indicator is really making that concrete, and eventually people would have a whole series of these for each uh, care principle and sub-principle to then evaluate care implementation in their setting. Okay, I know I, I uh, whizzed through a lot there, so Really looking forward to um, your questions. Happy to speak more to where we're at and uh, where we're headed on the projects that I mentioned. And again, I'm going to extend a big sign of my essay and thank you uh, for listening and to the organizers and my colleagues on this slide. Okay, take care.